sent it to, to... All right, so uh, welcome everyone. We're today for, uh, for today's Kadanov seminar, we're extremely happy to have Shiraz Minwala. Um, Shiraz needs no introduction, but I'll just quickly say that uh, over the past few years, he's led uh, pioneering work in hydrodynamics, holography, and in particular in 3D bosonization dualities, which he'll be telling us about today. So thanks a lot for joining us, Shiraz. Take it away. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's wonderful to be virtually at Chicago. I fondly remember many of my r physical trips in Chicago, including uh, one in which Sab Sabdeep and I went to a very vigorous uh, disco after my talk. Okay. Um, so, um, okay, so my talk today is titled uh, Fermi Seas from Bose Condensates and a Bosonic Exclusion, Exclusion Principle and is based uh, principally on this paper that came out maybe a month ago we, uh, together with my student Amir Mishra and uh, a postdoc at TIFR, Naveen Prabhakar. Uh, as you will see, this uh, my talk has uh, significant overlap with an older paper out of Chicago, a uh, paper by Gerasi, Goikman, and Sung. And uh, the, uh, the talk will also make some reference to work in progress with, with these authors. Okay, so uh, let me start with an introduction. It's well known that vector-like large n limits are easy to solve. So for instance, um, uh, large n Wilson Fisher theories are easy to solve. But matrix like large n limits are typically intractable. Uh, intractable. Uh, for instance, uh, large n QCDs, uh, large n Yang theory has, has not been solved. Okay. Now, large n SUN gauge theories, coupled to some uh, some kind of matter, have the matter in whatever representation you choose to put the matter in. But uh, um, uh, these theories also always have the gauge bosons, and the gauge bosons are always in the adjoint representation. And so uh, for SUN groups, this adjoint representation is a traceless N cross N matrix. So SUN gauge theories always have matrix degrees of freedom. Okay, and so they're of the sorts that are, that are typically hard to solve. Okay, there are some, ex some expect acceptation, uh, exceptions to this, uh, to this, uh, to this rule, um, um, where you can somehow get, get around the complicated nature of the, uh, of, of the theory of the, uh, the, the matrix large n, um, of, of the matrix of, of the large n limit with, with matrices. Uh, one famous example is Toft's solution of uh, 2D QCD uh, with fundamental quarks. And in this talk, we're going to look at uh, uh, a similar example, the study of pure Chern Simon's theory in three dimensional, uh, in three dimensions. Um, coupled to fundamental, uh, fundamental manner. Now, one way of understanding why this is an uh, this is going to be easier to solve at large end than a typical uh, large end gauge theory goes as follows. The difficult thing at large end, as we've just reviewed, uh, you see, we're going to take these theories and study them with fundamental manner. Now, the difficult thing at large end with gauge theories, as we've just re reviewed, are the gauge boson degrees of freedom. However, pure gauge theories, which are Chern-Simons couple, are exactly solvable at any value of n, and therefore at large n, and were exactly solved by Witten, um, maybe 30 years ago. Okay, so now our the matter Chern-Simons theories that we are uh, uh, that we're going to study in this uh, in this talk are these pure gauge theories coupled to some matter. The additional complication over and above the pure gauge theory is that of fundamental matter. Now this can't be solved at any value of n, but because it's fundamental matter, you might hope that uh, you can solve it at large n. So if you take SUN Chern Simon's theories coupled to fundamental matter, you can hope to put together the simplicity of the pure Chern Simon's theory, the topological theory, and the simplicity of uh, um, matter at large n, and put it together and solve the theory. Okay. Now, uh, these words, uh, uh, these words uh, uh, turn, out to be, uh, turn out to be correct. They turn out to lead to useful formulas. And uh, the large end solution of these Chern Simons theories um, with fundamental type matter has been, uh, you know, was first um, seriously explored about nine years ago in work in the Israeli group and our group in, in India and Harvard and Princeton. And then, uh, 
uh, over the last nine years has been studied quite a lot. Now, uh, the study of these exact large-end solutions has led to some uh, qualitative insights. And um, uh, I hope that in this talk, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, uh, highlight one new insight that, uh, that the study leads to. OK, so let me introduce the context of, of the talk. So I'm going to work today with the simplest and best studied large-end large uh, Maddox and Simons uh, duality, uh, or the duality between the two best studied uh, large-end theories. OK, um, these theories are, are as follows. One side, on one side, what we'll study is the SUNF, John Simon's theory, a couple of fundamental fermions, and at a particular level. And at the level, well, with some convention, the level is uh, in the UV is KF minus sine KF by two. So that uh, once you integrate out the mass of fermions, we, we've got a fermion, we, we have the freedom to add a mass term for this fermion. The level for the John Simon's theory becomes an integer, which is either KF or modulus kf minus one, uh, depending on the sign of mf. Okay, so this theory here is, a, what, what, what is this theory? It's a theory just without the gauge fields. It would be a theory of just free fermions with a mass. And you take this free fermion theory with a the mass, this free fermion, there are n free fermions, so there's an sun global symmetry, and you gauge this sun global symmetry, and you put the gauge fields in the theory uh, to be self-coupled with, uh, with an sunf uh, John Simon's action at level uh, at this level. So this is one of the theories that we will study through this talk. Okay, uh, we we will call these theories regular fermion theories. Okay? The regular refers to the fact that they're not critical. Well, what I mean by that will become clear as we look at the boson. The second theory we will study through this talk is uh, what I will call the critical boson theory. So what is this theory? This theory, if we ignore the gauging for a while. It's just bosons coupled to the strange Lagrange multiplier sigma b phi bar phi and then some sort of mass deformation. Let's ignore this mass deformation for a moment. Okay, what is this theory? Uh, bosons coupled to sigma b phi bar phi. Well, one way of understanding what this theory is is, is, as, far, is as follows. Add in your mind an, a term which is epsilon sigma b square and later take epsilon to zero. So if you add this epsilon sigma b square and then complete the square in sigma b, what you do, what you generate is a phi bar phi, the whole thing squared, divided by epsilon. When we take epsilon to zero, this is a phi bar phi, the whole thing squared, with a very large coefficient. So this theory here is, uh, um, is really a, th a theory where you've turned on phi bar phi, the whole thing squared, and gone, gone all the way to the IR. It flowed down to very large coefficient of phi bar phi, the whole thing squared. It's the Wilson-Fisher theory. And uh, this, is, this turns out to be the correct way of mass deforming the Wilson Fisher. It's easy to see, but I won't review it. Okay, so without the gauging, this would be just Wilson Fisher theory as an, uh, a UN version, UNB version of Wilson Fisher theory, which is with a mass deformation. And then what we do is to take this, this, this UNB global symmetry and we gauge it with level uh, KB, KB. Now, there are two levels here because this is a UNB theory. UNB is SUNB times U1. And so you get to independently choose the level of the SUNB part and the U1 part. Um, none of these subtleties will bother us in the large end limit under consideration, so I will sort of ignore them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, effectively, this one level, the second one, the U1 level plays very little role in this. Okay. Uh, okay, excellent. So, so here we have the main players in, in my talk, the uh, regular fermion theory, John Simon's gauged, and the critical boson theory. Critical means Wilson Fisher. Okay. Critical boson theory, uh, John Simon's gauged. Okay. Now, um, as many of you have, have heard, part of the reason for the interest in the study of these matter John Simon's theories is that, uh, partly due to the study of the large end theories, partly from other points of view, it's been realized that these theories that I outlined for you in the previous transparency, uh, are actually secretly dual to each other, actually secretly the same theory, provided NFKF and NBKB are related and uh, MF, uh, MB3 are related according to a particular duality map. Okay, so to introduce this duality, let me set some notation. First, 
um, I'm going to define the shifted level of uh, the Chun Simon's theory. So kappa b is kb shifted by nb, you know, and retaining the sign of in modulus shifted by nb and retaining retaining the sign of kb. And I will define a, a toft coupling lambda b, which is nb by 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 kappa b. Okay. Um, this toft this lambda b here is a true toft coupling. It's, it's the thing that in the large end limit tells you how important a two-loop graph is compared to a one-loop graph. Okay, so it's it's uh, uh, something that tells you how strongly or weakly coupled your large end theory is uh, in terms of planar Feynman diagrams. Okay? Um, uh, the, the reason that it's NB, NB divided by KB um, is sort of simple. Oh, well, well, okay, it's, it's easy to see. Since one over KB appears outside the action, KB plays the role of G squared. Uh, one over KB plays the role of G squared angles. So NB by KB being held fixed is sort of like NB times G squared angles being held fixed. This is just standard though. And whether you work with K or kappa doesn't matter because that, it's just a shift by N. Okay, it's just a redefinition of your coupling curves. So uh, these, 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 these are just definitions. And the conjecture duality between these two theories is very simple when we're in terms of k and n. Uh, the conjecture duality is that kb is exchanged with nf up to some signs, and nb becomes the modulus of kf, and then the masses, the two mass deformations here are related to each other with some decoration involving the levels uh, and k's. Now these two results here are believed to be exact, namely they're believed to be true even at finite n and finite k. This result has come only out of explicit large n calculations, and so is known to be exact at large n in the large n top limit, could well receive one over n corrections. Okay. Um, this uh, duality map can be reworded in terms not of k and n, but in terms of kappa and lambda, if you, if you like. And it's easy to convince yourself that it takes this form. Kappa b is exchanged with kappa f, strips a sign. Lambda f, apart from signs, the modulus of lambda f goes to one minus the modulus of lambda b, and then lambda, lambda f and lambda b have opposite signs. That's what my words can be written, are precisely uh, captured by this equation. And then the masses are related as follows. Okay, so, uh, so they, they, these two theories will play a big role in my talk, and they believe to be related by, uh, by the duality who's, uh, uh, that I've listed. Now, in, in, in this talk, I'm going to ask, what are, what are the basic degrees of freedom of these theory? What are, what are the, the, the things that make up the guts of this theory? Um, well, what I mean by this will become more precise as we as I go. Okay, so one uh, attempt you might have at answering this question is to go to the conformal point. You know, from one point of view, theories become more simple. Th theories are simplest when they're conformal. And then mass deformation is just RG flows away from this conformal theory. So you might think, okay, the easiest way to think of this theory is to look at it as conformal. So, Shiraz, is it completely manifest at large n that there is a conformal point in these theories? Yes, completely manifest. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, suppose you work with, with a particular action and in dimensional regularization, uh, it's just clear. There's no beta function of any sort. It's completely right. Okay, because one of the interesting questions at small n is whether there is a conformal point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, at large n, in fact, order by order in a one over n expansion, I believe mm. you show that there's a conformal. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm confused. I mean, isn't, I mean, the mass is not acting like a mass? Oh, it, it acts like a mass, but you can switch it off and then it's never turned on in dimensional regularization. Okay. Right. So you set MF to MB Cree is equal to zero. You define that theory with, you know, with a scheme like dimensional regularization, and then just stays there for the usual reasons, right? Because you know, in dimensional regularization, you only get, you you only generate log mu's. Okay. So, right. Okay. Um, okay. Excellent. Right. So, uh, um, great. So now, so one attempt at answering this question might be. Uh, might be as follows. Um, uh, uh, you, you go to the conformal point and you think of this theory like any old conformal field theory. Um, so one way of thinking of this the theory then, you know, might be to say, well, in order to completely understand this theory, what I need to do is to understand the spectrum of local operators and then the correlation functions. 
Okay. Fine. So let's 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 go along this path for a minute. Uh, so what are the local operators? Local operators, of course, are one-to-one -one correspondence with states and S2. So these are isomorphic questions. Either states from the S2 or local operators. So what are local operators of this theory? Well, uh, um, in the large n limit, there are two kinds of operators. Um, there are the light operators, which are made out of bilinears of a fundamental and anti-fundamental field addressed with derivatives. So this is what they like for the fermions. This is what they like for the bosons, schematically speaking. OK, and I call such operators single sum operators. Um, they play the role that single trace operators play in a, in a theory of action. OK, also there are baryons. Uh, there are heavy operators, operators whose dimensions go to, Z, to, go to infinity in the large n limit, those large n limits. Uh, these operators for the, in the fermionic theory are baryons. And in the uh, bosonic theory, you recall, the, the, the theories I particularly wrote down here, not that it's going to make much of a difference, are SUN fermions and UN bosons. I could have studied many other pairs. Okay? But for these theories, the heavy operators are baryons on the fermionic side and monopoles on the bosonic side. And uh, um, yeah, you're, you're, from this point of view, the fundamental degrees of freedom are the single sum operators and then they're multi, they're multi products. The baryon and monopole operators are the multi products. And uh, we could try to study the correlation functions of these, these guys. Now, there are, uh, and this is, of course, you know, this is not a bad thing to do. But uh, uh, this is a very complicated thing to do if you want to be, you want to do it, including at energies large compared to n. The reason is that the spectrum of operators, which is simple at low energies, especially when you can ignore all of these, uh, just the, it's just like a fox space of these operators. It starts becoming complicated at energies of order n or higher because of the analogs of trace identities. Identities of op between operators that tell you that uh, the... Uh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Okay, I I identities of operators that, uh, that, that tell you that these, these, these operators aren't all independent. There are relations between the operators. Okay? And uh, these uh, relations can get very complicated. And basically, they just, they're just a reflection, the, at least at the classical level, they're a reflection of the fact that these operators weren't really elementary. This operator wasn't really an elementary operator. It was made up of two, two sides, a psi bar and a psi. Okay? This operator wasn't really an elementary operator. It was epsilon times n size. Okay? So the fact that it was composed of more elementary objects shows up in these, these uh, uh, complicated relations between these operators. Okay. Another way of saying that this is sort of, uh, you know, viewing this just in terms of the of these gauge invariant local operators, it's not always very, uh, always, is not for some purposes very useful, um, goes as follows. We could ask the question, are these theories bosonic or are they fermionic? Well, let's, let's view this question in terms of local gauge invariant operators. In terms of local gauge invariant operators, all these light operators are always bosonic because they're bilinears. So whether psi is bosonic or fermionic, who cares? In terms, for these guys, this, these baryon operators are bosonic if NF, you know, if NF of SUNF is even, and they're uh, fermionic if NF is odd. There's a more subtle corresponding statement, but the monop monopole operators here are uh, bosonic if KB is even, and fermionic if KB is odd. Okay? Do you really, so, mean, do you really mean monopole? I thought monopole and two plus one dimensions is an instanton-like object. Right, what do I mean by monopole operator? Well, a monopole, it's, it's an operator, it's not a, not a state. Ah. It's an insertion in the, a local insertion in the path of state. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay, um, uh, right. So, uh, uh, right, so, you know, from this point of view, you would say that if K, if NF was even, both theories, NF is even, which is same as KF is even, uh, KB is even. Uh, both theories are bosonic, so it's a both both duality. On the other hand, if NF was odd, you'd say both theories are fermionic, so it's a Fermi Fermi duality. Uh, this changes from NF being a billion to NF being billion plus ones. Okay, it's true and it's a bit odd. Okay. However, in this talk, I'm going to advocate that for some purposes, this is not the most useful viewpoint. It's not most useful to think of this thing in terms of these 
Dendron Marion operators, it's better for many purposes to think of these theories built out of the, the elementary non gauge invariant degrees of freedom, namely the phi and the psi quanta. Okay. Uh, this point of view is sort of similar to the following viewpoint that for some purposes, for instance, for the finite temperature, high temperature partition function, in QCD, it's much better to think of the theory as being built out of quarks and gluons rather than glue balls and mesons. Okay? So this is the uh, point of view I'm going to advocate to, start, to understand this theory, and we're going to run with it. Shiraz, if we, if we take uh, one of those phi or psi gauge non-invariant things and attach a Wilson line to it, does it create a finite energy? Is, is that like a good operator that makes a finite energy state? In the yes. So in, well, yeah, yes. And in particular, you know, uh, in particular, if you take one of these theories, I'm, as I'm going to say in two minutes, uh, if you take one of these theories and mass it up, mm -hmm. Then these phi or psi operators create asymptotic states that you can use to scatter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just like a uh, just like an electron operator. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So you know it's a very physical object. Okay, excellent. Uh, so as I just said in response to Clay's question, uh, this point of view is sort of best um, clearest uh, that that it's physical is clearest when once you turn on a mass on both sides. So once you turn on a mass on both sides, these, uh, uh, these, these, the, um, th there are physical excitations created by a single phi or psi operator. Um, a stable physical excitation. We know, by the way, at large end that, that, that this is true because we can compute the phi phi, phi two point function. And we see that as a pole at finite finite value. It's stable 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 physical excitation that can move up to infinity in R two. Okay, so from this point of view, it's interesting. From, from, from my point of view, it's in a way more natural to study the theory after turning on, having turned on the mass than, than before having turned on the mass. Then we can look, look at the massless theory as a limit if we want. Okay, so um, fine. So let's look at masses for a moment. Let's look at the bosonic side. So the mass term here is, is the only relevant depth only relevant deformation of this conformal field theory, since it's just one relevant deformation, uh, it's a real parameter. The mass term, you know, uh, uh, the RG flows induced by this mass term um, are all equivalent up to scale, except for a sign. Any mass that's positive can be set to mass equals one by scaling. And any mass that's negative can be set to mass equals minus one by scaling. But one and minus one are different. Okay, so we've got a single real parameter, and there are two inequivalent RG flows that um, uh, one induced by positive mass, one induced by negative mass. The endpoints of these RG flows are two different massive phases of the theory, mass or really topological phases for that one. Okay, so let's look at these two phases. Um, we're, we're working first on the bosonic side. Okay, um, if we turn on a positive mass deformation, then um, what? what for a moment, imagine that the theory wasn't gauged. Well, what we're doing is taking these SUN spins and making them paramagnetic. Okay, they're, they're sort of massive spin like excitations. Okay, on the other hand, if we turn on a negative mass deformation, okay, then we, we would have taken these, 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 SUN, uh, these SUN spins and made them ferromagnetic. The, the SUN spins would have wanted to condense. So the SUN, negative mass def, uh, deformation makes the SUN spins, the phi fields want to condense. But now our theory is gauged. In the absence of gauging, this condensation would have led, led to Goldstone bosons. But because it's gauged, that doesn't happen. Instead, what we have is the Higgs mechanism. Okay, so you've got this SUN theory, and then one field phi condenses in this SUN theory. It leads, symmetry is broken from SUN to SUN minus one. And uh, the, the degrees of freedom in the spin field are eaten up into making, the, into making one W boson, one fundamental W boson of the SUN minus one, and one um, neutral Z boson of the SUN minus one massive. Okay, so the second phase, the degrees of freedom of this theory are not just the, the simple degrees of freedom created by the phi field, simple sort of naively scalar degrees of freedom created by the phi field, as would have been the case in the paramagnetic, the MB pre greater than zero phase. They, they are instead the, the, the vector degrees of freedom uh, created by the W bosons. And also the Z boson, though that will play very little role in what I'm going to say. Okay. Now, uh, 
um uh, now when we've got these massive theories we can eat, we can go to very low energies so that the massive excitations are not important and look at what the theories are at very low energies very low energies you've just got pure chan simon theory on the boson side if you have a positive mass deformation you just get a unb kb kb theory which is dual to the SUNF KF theory, which is ordinary topological level rank dual to the Bosani, uh, to the uh, to the SUNF KF theory that you get when you integrate out the massive fermions, whose mass, which have a mass of the same sign as KF, that turns out to be dual to that's dual to MB Cree being greater than zero. On the other hand, if MB Cree the ma bosonic mass is negative, so that we have the spontaneous symmetry breaking. We go down to a U N B minus one theory. The level hasn't shifted, okay? But uh, uh, that then is dual to the uh, the topological theory you get by integrating out fermions of opposite mass, uh, whose mass is opposite to the sign, who has a sign opposite to that of K F. And when you do that, you find that the effective level that you get after integrating out these fermions is this guy here. And this, if you look at it carefully, you will convince yourself, you know, the Lanky is reduced by one, but the level here is reduced by one uh, in, absol in absolute magnitude. And so you, you will see that the, um, the, uh, 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 that these two low energy theories are also ordinary topological level rank dual to each other. Okay. Here, now, apart from these topological theories, we've got these massive excitations. So the massive excitations here on this side, we've just seen here, they're just the things created by the phi field. Here, uh, here are the things created by the W bosons. On this side, however, they're both the, ex the excitations are both the excitations created by the psi field. Okay, one is a positive mass psi field, one is a negative, uh, you know, one is a psi field of one, one sign of mass, the psi field of another sign of mass. Now, I want to take the point of view that these are the elementary degrees of freedom of the theory and they should map to each other. Okay, so it should be that the, on the first phase, the basic phi excitations map to the psi excitations. The second phase, the W bosons map, map to the psi excitations. And uh, so this is the claim I want to make. And once you stop, once you make this claim, you, you, you encounter several puzzles. So let's, let's look, at, look, look at these puzzles one by one. Puzzle number one is this. Phi is classically a scalar, uh, well, phi is a scalar field. And its excitations classically have spin zero. W mu is a vector field. Its ex excitations classically have spin one. Or more precisely, it's spin modulus one. And uh, the actual spin, turns, it's easy to check, is, this, is the spin of uh, it's either plus one or minus one, which one is given by the sign of KB. On the other hand, psi uh, is a fermionic field. It's a spin half field. And its excitations classically have, 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 have uh, the following spins, sine MF by two. So positive of MF, half of MF is positive, and minus half of MF is negative. Now, it sounds like this is a basic elementary mismatch of expectations. I was trying to argue that phi and the uh, psi field, or the W boson, uh, W and the psi field, in the excitations created by these should be dual to each other. But how can they be dual if they have different spins? The answer to this question, so, the, the, either this picture of matching elementary excitations is wrong or something must give. And the answer turns out to be sort of nice. Um, the answer is, of course, that the classical spin is not the true spin of these excitations. But uh, you can say this more in, in a nicer way. You see, once you've got an excitation in your, in your problem, that excitation carries some, some charge and also traps flux. And by doing a simple no charge kind of calculation, you can convince yourself of the following. Okay, uh, you can convince yourself that that combination of charge and flux carries some angular momentum. This comes from the John Simons Lagrange. The magnitude of that angular momentum for an SUN, for an SUN theory, this is an extra piece when, when it's a UN theory. The magnitude of that, that angular momentum is the quadratic Casimir of the representation that your, your particle is transforming in, divided by two kappa, where kappa was the shifted level that I introduced in the earlier. Okay, so now, well, the, uh, now you see, on the previous slide, we saw that classical spins didn't match. Classical spins are what I'm calling intrinsic spins here. Okay, but uh, th there was no reason for these classical spins to match. The net spin of the excitation should match. 
So what should be true for duality, if it be true, is that the sum of the intrinsic spin plus the statistical spin for bosons should be the sum of the uh, intrinsic spin plus the statistical spin for the fermions. Now, just by doing a, just by doing some simple group theory with this formula and its analog for UN, it's easy to check that the statistical spin for the fermion minus the statistical spin for the boson is sine KB by two, which is the, which is the same as minus sine KF by two, because KB and KF have opposite sides. Okay, so taking, uh, um, taking SB to that side, okay, and in putting in the fact that SF, the intrinsic spin of the fermion is sine MF by two, you see that this relationship will work. So the duality between two spins will work, provided SB intrinsic is given by this formula. Half of sine MF, MF that's, that was the SF intrinsic, minus this, this object, which was um, this difference between SF, uh, S that fermionic and S that bosonic. Now let's check. Okay, so now this is what must be true of dualities. Maps these two excitations. Let's check if it is true. Okay, um, and, uh, in the phase in which MB3 is greater than zero, sine MF and sine KF are the same. That's what the duality map tells you. So this just gives you zero, and that's great because in the fa phase where the bosons have positive mass, the intrinsic excitation, the classical uh, spin of, ex of bosonic excitations is zero. On the other hand, in the phase in which the boson bosons have negative mass, that maps to sine MF and sine KF having opposite signs. So this turns out to be minus sine KF, which is equal to sine KB, which is exactly the same as the, uh, the, the spin of uh, the intrinsic spin of a W boson. So these intrinsic spins do match for these non-gauge invariant particles, which is an encouraging sign for this idea of relating these two, the, these two objects. Shiraz, uh, yeah. um, could you use the formulas on the previous slide to constrain representations that can appear in uh, dualities? Yes. Because so, the U of R is a fixed. Yes, exactly, you can. Um, so basically, if you have large enough representations, if you have, rep let's say you've got a representation with four, let's say with six boxes. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you've got large enough representations, this will only work if the difference between intrinsic spins is large. Mm. So if you're going to try to build a field theory where the uh, largest difference between intrinsic spins is two, the, the, this difference could be where if, if uh, on the left-hand side, you've got W bosons of spin one, and the right-hand side, you've got W bosons of minus one. If you, if, if you put that as a constraint in your, your, your construction, that the largest difference between intrinsic spins is two, then that, will, that allows you to put a bound on how large these representations can be. So in fact, um, uh, we've looked at every known example of, uh, uh, of both, as you know, in every known example of both Fermi uh, duality, all the representations that are involved are rather small. Yeah. There's adjoints, there's fundamentals, and so on. And uh, uh, this kind of thing works for every known example. And it also seems clear that something rather exotic will have to happen if you look for examples with larger field theories. Just because then the intrinsic spins would have to be not the kinds that we normally put in field theories. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, yeah. Uh, we, in one of our forthcoming papers, we even have a precise version of the statement uh, for, for what, what representations could appear. Of course, yeah. Assuming that we can't make sense of field theories with, with some assumptions. Okay, excellent. Good. So we've seen that uh, proposed dual excitations have uh, equal values. Um, and so all their space time quantum numbers match. I haven't told you about this, but you know, this, this was the easy part. Then there was the part uh, that you want to check that the masses of the excitations also match. Okay. And uh, um, at large end, you can compute the propagators of the W bosons, let's say, and the propagators of the fermions. Um, you get some, 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 some propagators, and you get these propagators of poles, and these pole march masses match across the reality. So these elementary excitations are characterized you know, from physical space-time numbers are those of a mass and a spin, and they match across the reality. 
both of them, the mass and the spin both match. So wonderful, these elementary excitations have the same intrinsic quantum numbers. Uh, and you might think that's great, but this is not enough to resolve all paradoxes. Okay. Um, and um, the, uh, it's not enough to resolve all paradoxes because, uh, because what, what happens when we start looking at multi-particle states? You see, on the left-hand side, on, on, on one side, you've got, let's say, two, a two fermion system. On the right-hand side, you've got a two boson system. Now, two, two fermion systems are supposed to be anti-symmetric in exchange of quantum numbers. But two boson systems are supposed to be symmetric in exchange of quantum numbers. Uh, how then, how can it work? You know, how, how can it work that the multi-particle spectrum of the two theories involving many of these particles uh, maps across duality? Now, you might at first suspect that something like this is true. You might at first suspect that, you know, what's going on is that there's flux trapping. So these particles are neither really bosonic, nor any, uh, no, 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 no uh, fermionic, but anionic, and they may be anions in the same way. That turns out not to be true at large n. In fact, no, 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 not to be true at any value of n that's not equal to 1. And there's a special exception, which is n equals 1, k equals 1, which is how it works. Okay, where the boson turns into a fermion, or the fermion turns into a boson, and then there's no real puzzle anymore. But at any other value of n, and certainly in the large n limit, this is not the case. In order to see how you know that that's not the case, what we can do is to take these massive excitations and go down to low energies. Low energies compared uh, low, uh, to low momenta compared to their rest masses. And then the theory is described by some non-relativistic non -relativistic theory. And we can look at this two-particle two particle system described by some Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation turns out to be the Schrodinger equation for these two particle, uh, for, for the relative, relative coordinate of these two particles moving in a flux tube. And the value of that flux tube, which captures based essentially the anionic phase when one particle goes around the other, is given by some group theory formula. Now you can evaluate this, 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 this the value of this flux tube, and it turns out that for the exchange of two fundamental particles, uh, this effective flux is of order one over n. Okay, uh, I've skipped some details, but anyway, this is the final outcome. So you see, when you're, when you're scattering two fundamental particles or two anti-fundamental particles, the anionic nature of the scattering is not important at large n because this, this effective flux goes to zero. So that's not the answer. The answer for how bosonic statistics becomes fermionic statistics is not that anionic phases change bosons into fermions, not in this channel, not when you're scattering um, two fundamental particles. There's, there's an interesting aside for when this is true, but I'm back on, I'm, I'm not doing well at time, so I'll skip it. Okay, excellent. So, um, now, you know, the resolution, so how, how does this work? Well, the resolution to this puzzle is sort of interesting. Okay, now uh, one way of computing this, uh, this, you know, getting the resolution is to do a computation. In the large end limit, turns out just a poss possible to just compute the scattering of two fermions uh, and scattering of two bosons. To just compute the S matrices explicitly by summing diagrams. Okay. Now, when you say scattering of two fermions, um, this is of course a function of Mandelstam invariance, but it's also a function of something else. These two fermions are, let's say, uh, okay, these two fundamental particles, let's say, are uh, they, they've got fundamental gauge indices, and they can scatter with the uh, in the, in the channel in which the initial particles are coupled either to the symmetric representation of the two fundamental indices or the anti-symmetric representation. These two different couplings have independent S matrices. So there's one function of Mandelstam invariance when you couple the two fundamental part indices to symmetric, and another function of Mandelstam invariance when you couple the two fundamental indices to anti-symmetric. Now, in both these channels, you can compute both the bosonic and the fermionic S matrix, and when you do the camp computation, you find something interesting. You find that the symmetric S matrix for the bosons is equal to the anti-symmetric S matrix of the fermions and vice versa. The anti-symmetric S matrix for the bosons is equal to the symmetric S matrix for the fermions and vice versa. Okay. So this tells you what's going on. What's going on is that the map goes as follows. 
the map says that in these in the space of uh, uh, of uh, uh, quantum numbers physical quantum spa uh, space time quantum numbers of these elementary particles map to each other across the duality but the map is more involved for the gauge quantum numbers okay remember these gauge quantum numbers are fake because in the end we will study gauge invariance let's say on the sphere but at the, at the level of these building blocks, the map is more, more, more complicated at the level of, for these gauge quantum numbers. In particular, the map says that symmetrizing in gauge indices maps to anti-symmetrizing in gauge indices and vice versa. This now explains, of course, the difference between statistics. Because you see, a bosonic wave function has to be symmetric under interchange of all indices. A fermionic wave function has to be anti-symmetric under interchange of all indices. So suppose we take a bosonic wave function that is symmetric under under the color indices, it maps a fermionic wave function that's anti-symmetric under the color, exchange of the color indices. To obey their res relative respective statistics, both of these wave functions then have to be symmetric under interchange of space-time indices. Right? Because that is symmetric stripes symmetric for the bosons and symmetric times anti-symmetric for the fermions. So the same symmetry for physical quantum numbers leads to correct statistics, including all quantum numbers, including these, these invisible gauge quantum. So the lesson here is that the difference between Bose and Fermi statistics is comp compensated by a non-trivial duality action on the hidden gauge indices. Okay, and uh, uh, this, in retrospect, is not a surprise because um, uh, because level rank duality for topological chern simons theories came with a map for how Wilson loops transform, and uh, this is part of the map for how Wilson loops transform. The Wilson loops and the symmetric transform to Wilson loops and the anti-symmetric. Um, in some sense, the same things at play here. In fact, topological chern simons gauge theory, uh, level rank duality was always built to be upgraded to both, both Fermi duality. It's just that we didn't realize it. I'm, I'm confused. So, um, yeah. so you, you seem to be making a distinction between um, gauge flux that is carried in some kind of anionic way, you know, by flux attachment to the particle and gauge flux that is carried by some kind of Wilson line degree of freedom. Sorry, what is the Wilson line degree of freedom? Um, well, uh, if you back up a slide. Um, so I thought that was what you were talking about, hidden gauge indices. Maybe no. I understand. I, 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 what I was saying here was something very, very simple. Suppose we take a two, two particle system made out of two fundamentals. Okay, now we look at the wave function such in a channel where it is symmetric under interchange of the gauge indices. Okay. Okay. No Wilson lines, just symmetrizing the gauge indices. Okay, and, where, and then symmetric in interchange of the space-time indices. That thing is symmetric under interchange of all indices. But the non-trivial statement here is that in gauge space, Symmetrization in gauge indices maps to anti-symmetrization on the other side in, in gauge indices. Mm -hmm. As we see explicitly from this S-matrix calculation. S-matrix in an anti-symmetric channel on the fermionic side maps to the S-matrix and symmetric channel on the other side. Where anti-symmetric and symmetric uh, refer to what's happening with the gauge indices. Okay, so I'm not absorbing these gauge indices anyhow. I'm just leaving them around. Eventually, they will be all eaten up because these gauge indices will combine together for physical states and S2 to be a singlet. But at component level, they're there. And the map at component level in involves this, this, this uh, symmetric with anti-symmetric. Okay, but in this, in this sort of non-relativistic scattering you were talking about previously, where is yeah. this effect? Where is this effect? Okay, so in this non-relativistic scattering, actually, if you looked very carefully, if you had the ability to go beyond the leading large n limit here, you would see uh, you would see that in the value of the fluxes. However, uh, that is very difficult because that very difficult to do calculationally because the anionic flux trapped in these two channels is both of order one over n. So the full S matrix here is an effectively non-anionic S matrix. You know, it's just some, it's like the contact interactions uh, that give you all, 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 all the fun. It's not because of the flux. The flux is playing basically no role. It's the other interactions that, that matter uh, okay. in the large end of it. 
if you were working at finite end, you would see you would see the difference between these two fluxes. That's beyond our calculational capacity uh, in the field. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Now, um, uh, I just want to point out something I've more or less said, but I just say it again here. You see, the map here. The fact that these gauge indices are behaving funny is, a, is, is an aspect of something else that was obviously true. You see, there's no straightforward sense in which a fundamental phi can map to a fundamental psi. Because there are, phi has NB gauge indices, while psi has NF gauge indices. It's just the number of gauge indices are different. Okay, and that's okay because these, uh, right. The one a way to think of this is as follows. Suppose we regard this, this, we take this theory and quantize it on an S2. Then just because of the Gauss law, all physical states in the end have to be gate singlets. So a single fermion doesn't produce a physical state. Okay, you've got to put enough of these guys so that you can contract away all gauge indices, make the whole thing eventually a singlet. Okay, now, what the, the idea is that the, the duality works at the level of the building blocks in making these physical states. Okay. How this works, you know, for few particle states, in, at least in the large limit, is sort of obvious. Because what, all you get is that uh, the, way to make, the way you make fundamentals is that uh, psi is combined with psi bars, and phi is combined with phi bars. And then there is a nice map between the bilinears on, on the two sides. That's like the operator map we talked about. However, as I said, things become more complicated when we go to energies large compared to n, where you first have these heavy operators and second you have these, these complicated trace relations. Okay, so whether this is all really working well, now can be addressed with another question, which, and this question is, do the thermal free energies of the two, two theories agree? And how can you view these thermal, thermal free energies? How can you view these thermal free energies in terms of these elementary phi and psi particles? And now we're coming to the main part of the talk. Okay, so uh, let me, I'm gonna have to give you a like five minute light ring review of some formalism, and then, then, then when I get to what I really wanted to say. See, the thermal partition function of these, of these theories, um, we and other people understood how to calculate these, these, these partition functions uh, eight or nine years ago. Uh, and then these, these things have been constantly improved. Um, the basic idea is this. We've got to compute a partition function of this theory in S2 times S1. This partition function includes an integral over all the modes of the theory, but there's one special mode, which is the zero mode of the holonomy around the, the S1 circle. And then there's everything else, a fixed value of holonomy. Okay, turns out that using large n techniques, you can calculate this everything else as a function of this fixed value of holonomy. And then what you're left with is a single sort of matrix kind of large n matrix integral over the zero mode of the holonomy. Okay, so that's what I've said here. This, the great thing is that this V of phi, which is the, uh, the integral over everything else as a function of, of the holonomy. Rho is the eigenvalue density function of the holonomy. Okay, I'm not giving you all the details. Um, uh, the great thing is that this can be just computed. Okay, um, the way that the computation goes is that you compute the thermal two-point functions of the bosons or the fermions. That calculation be, can be completely explicitly done using a Schwinger Dyson equation. To solve an integral equation, which incredibly enough turns out to be solvable. It's a non-linear integral equation, but you can just solve it. Okay, and then, uh, um, and then, uh, one of the features of this integral, the solution to this integral equation, by the way, is that uh, uh, that there are exact poles. There are poles this, th that the two-point functions, even at finite temperature, poles and no cuts. So the thermal excitations of this theory are stable at a leading order of energy. And then once you've got this two-point function, you can bootstrap it up to a, a formula for the free energy. I'm not going to give you the details. You can do this calculation. It's been done. And the ans final answer for this calculation take, uh, turns out to take the following form. The final answer for the calculation turns out to be given as follows. If we wanted to find this, this, this V of rho, what, we, what we're supposed to do is first, what we get is this, this quantity here. There's, uh, there's a sort of off-shell version of this V of rho, 
which is a very explicit function of the UV parameters like this MB critical and, uh, and the lambda, the, the, uh, the Tov coupling, as well as all the holonomies. But it's also a function of two auxiliary variables, S tilde and CB. Okay. Now, the answer for V of rho is taken by taking this quantity and extremizing it with respect to these auxiliary var variables, S tilde and CP. That, that's what comes out of calculation. Okay, uh, the CB here has an interpretation. The interpretation is that of the thermal mass of these stable excitations that, that arise even at finite temperatures. Okay, now I, I, I've, said, I've, I've, I've said this here. Okay, now actually these, these, express, these expressions I said were computed some, some time ago. Um, actually, that was not completely accurate. Um, okay, these, these expressions were computed some, some time ago at zero chemical potential. And the expressions, uh, okay, I should say that our theories, each of our theories has a U1 global symmetry. And one can turn on a chemical potential with respect to that U1 global symmetry. Okay, and you can generalize this free energy calculation to a calculation at non-zero value of this of this chemical potential. And it turns out that the formulas in the previous literature uh, were all correct, provided that the chemical potential was smaller than the saddle point value, the value that is obtained on minimizing this object of the thermal mass. You might expect that something interesting happens when chemical potential exceeds thermal mass because then bosons tend to uh, you know tend to both condense okay and uh, in the calculation something complicated happened and uh, all previous results were presented in this regime okay so okay, sorry, in, in sure yes. can, can you say a little more about this the the crossover um, temperature as a function of chemical potential is just a border chemical potential or there's an, a factor exactly, of n exactly equal to when equal to. Okay. You, you take this object here and extremize it and find CB. Mm -hmm. Okay? CB is a function of everything else. And, you know, when the CB is equal to the chemical potential, or CB is la uh, larger than the chemical potential, then this formula is just correct. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when CB it becomes smaller than the chemical potential, something in the calculation goes wrong. And CB is and equal to temperature, or what, what is the relation between CB and temperature? No, no, no. CB is something complicated. Uh -huh. So, it's, it's something that you've got to find by extremizing this, this complicated thing. It's a very complicated object. Okay. It's given in terms of temperature and chemical potential, but it's, there's no simple answer for it. I see. Thank you. Right. Okay, but once, whatever you've done, once you've got it, when CB is greater than the chemical potential, this formula was correct. Getting it from this equation was correct. Okay, so one of the first technical generalizations in, our, you know, in the paper that I told you about was to correct this formula so that, that it was correct so that it was correct also, um, also when in the other regime, when CB is larger than, uh, CB is smaller than mod mu. Turns out that this is the correct formula for the boson. The first two lines of what I'd written before, that was in the previous literature. And then there's an additional piece here. Uh, there's an additional piece here, which is proportional to theta of mod mu minus CB. Okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then you get this. Fine. So now we've got the correct off-shell free energy for our bosonic theory. Okay. Um, there's a similar story you can play. It's a similar game you can play with the fermion theory. And if we're looking at the theory on an S2 that is extremely large, which is what I will focus on in this talk. There are interesting issues for varying the sign of that S2, but we don't have the time for that. If we're looking for an S2 that is very large, then the, firm, then the naive results for the fermion theory just were uncorrected. The old results were uncorrected. Uh, these, th there was no correction term like this. Okay. So now that we've got this nice free energy function, this off-shell free energy function, okay, uh, that basically allows us to, uh, that basically allows us to, uh, 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 that basically computes allows us to compute the uh, to compute the, uh, the the free energy of our system at finite temperature and chemical potential. Okay. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, one of the things that we we can do with this with this free energy formula, uh, one of the things that one can do with the free energy formula, is um, uh, is to compute the charge of our system. 
and uh, um, uh, and this brings brings us, you know, to the to the last of my sort of fake puzzles, and the resolution to the puzzle will be the you know the punchline of my talk, uh, which goes this way. See, I've told you that in these systems that th this this the systems under consideration are a collection of almost free um, uh, quasi particles of quasi particles even at finite temperature and finite chemical potential. Okay, the the quasi particles are not completely free. Uh, but they're not free in the sense that the properties, for instance, the thermal mass of a quasi uh, of, of a quasi boson is of the function of what other states are failed. Is what the temperature is, what the chemical potential is. But once you've got, apart from that sort of mean field sort of renormalization, these are almost free excitations, as you can see from the fact that even at finite temperature and finite chemical potential, these the two point functions of these particles are poles and no comes. They don't decay. These, these these excitations are sort of stable in the finite temperature and finite chemical potential. Of course, that's strictly leading order logic. Okay, now you might say, well, well, if that's the case, then what must be happening at finite temperature? If we've got these effectively almost free excitations, or well, what we might expect at finite temperature and finite chemical potential is that each of these, the, the, the level is occupied so many times. Because that's the classic formula of Fermi Dirac statistics for free particles. And you might say that, well, on the bosonic side, each of these levels here should be occupied so many times, because that's the classic formula for Bose Einstein statistics for effectively free particles. And if that's the case, how, how is it possible for the thermodynamics to agree? How is it possible, for instance, for the charge of the two ensembles to agree? Okay, so now you can do the calculation. Okay, the calculation is to just compute the charge of the two ensembles. You take the free energy, you differentiate it with respect to chemical potential, you do some tricks, and then you get, you get an answer. Um, the answer can be written as a sum over charges or over every single particle state, just like you might have suggested here. Here you, you would have said, take every single particle state, assign it an occupation number, and sum over single particle states. That's the form the answer takes. Yeah. However, the value of the occupation number for the fermionic particles Turns out not to be given by this by this naive expectation, okay, but instead to be given by this more sophisticated formula. Line one of this more sophisticated formula was presented in the paper by Sohn Gera, uh, Gerasi, Goitman, and Sohn that I cited at the beginning of my talk. The only addition to this formula that we've done, the epsilon addition to this formula that we did in our papers, uh, notice that this integral that they presented could be explicitly evaluated. We've got a closed form expression. Okay, for the case of fermions, okay, uh, for the case of fermions, you take this occupa effective occupation number. So, so what we're saying is that the charge of the ensemble is reproduced if we assign the following occupation number to every single particle state, following rather simple occupation number to every particle. Now, what's, what's the deal with this occupation number? First, this occupation number formula depends as usual on the, on the energy and the charge and the chemical potential and the temperature, but also depends on the, on the Thoff coupling part. So it's a one parameter generalization of this classic formula. And it's a one parameter generalization that reduces to this formula and the limit lambda f goes to zero. So when the fermion theory is very weakly coupled, you get the usual result. And then you get these more uh, interesting occupation. Uh, in our paper, what we did was to generalize this analysis to bosons. We found that the same result holds true for bosons. This actually required the new technical advance because, because we needed that extra term in the free energy formula. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, you find that the formula for the occupation number for bosons is given by this plus this theta function. That had its origin in the new term in the free energy formula. And then when you combine this integral, you can do this integral and combine it with the theta function and you find this, the following form. Okay. So the effective occupation number for every bosonic state is given by this more complicated formula. Now, this new result is also a one parameter generalization of the classic result of occupation numbers for Bose Einstein particles. Um, and it reduces to the old result, the classic result in the limit lambda b goes to zero when epsilon is greater than q times mu. The q is the um, charge of each state. And for our case, it's q is either plus one or minus one. Uh, it's fundamental, we're working in the normalization, so every single particle, fundamental particle has q equals one. Every 
anti-fundamental particular field group minus one. Okay, wonderful. So what we've seen is that the effective charge of these ensembles can be understood in some single particle way. So particle state by particle state, provided you associate appropriate, appropriate uh, occupation numbers. Now, how do these occupation numbers map across duality? You might at first naively have thought that we should expect that NF maps to NB. When you do the calculation, you find not that NF maps to NB, but you find the more interesting relationship. Capital NF, the rank of the gauge group times N little NF, is capital NB times little NB. But now when you think about this for a moment, this is precisely what you should have expected to find. Because you say, the number of single particle states for the fermions, that, that there's a single particle state associated with every space-time quantum, quantum numbers, but then that's multiplied by NF equal such single particle states, one for each color quantum. Okay, similarly for the boson. So this gives the total occupation number for any state with given space-time quantum numbers once you sum over all color quantum. And this gives the total occupation number for any single particle state with given space-time quantum numbers once you, once you sum over all, all, all color quantum numbers at the bosonic side. So once again, we see that the way, you know, that matching under duality, matching of these kind of occupation numbers under duality, it's somehow crucial that, uh, to include the invisible gauge quantum numbers in the game. Now, to understand what's going on here, I'll take maybe five minutes extra, if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yes. To understand what's going on here, uh, it's useful, yeah, often in physics, it's useful, you know, when you've got some finite, finite temperature stuff to take the zero temperature limit. Um, in the absence of a chemical potential, the zero temperature, thermodyna zero temperature thermodynamics is, is empty. But in the presence of chemi uh, chemical potential, zero temperature thermodynamics is far from empty. It can be very rich. So let's look at this form, these, these, these results, um, these occupation number results that, um, uh, that, that I presented for you, the results of Gerasi, Hoichmann, and so on, and uh, the bosonic results. And uh, look at what happens to them in the zero temperature limit, but at fixed chemical potential. Now, Gerasi, Goitman, and Sohn already noted that in, the, in this limit, the limit of zero chemical potential, uh, zero temperature and fixed chemical potential, um, this occupation number formula becomes extremely simple. It becomes this formula, which just tells you that every single particle state of energy below mu is occupied exactly once. But that's what, you know, that's, that's just like a simple free Fermi C. So what we're seeing is that despite the fact that this, this occupation number formula is quite interesting and involved at non-zero temperature and chemical potential, once you take the zero temperature limit on the fermion side, it becomes extremely boring. Our, our fermionic state is just a boring garden variety Fermi C of particles, fermions with renormalized quantum mass. Okay, what's the deal on the bosonic side? Well, life is a little more interesting on the bosonic side. On the bosonic side, when we take the zero temperature limit of our occupation numbers, we get a sort of similar answer. We find that the occupation number here has this theta function times this n bar, where n bar takes this value. Okay? Now, the theta function tells you immediately that every state with energy greater than mu is unoccupied. Same as what happened in a Fermi C. Okay, Q, remember, is, here pl is plus minus one. So just say it's plus one, for instance. Okay, so every state with energy greater than mu or greater, greater than mod mu is unoccupied. Okay, that's what this theta function tells you. This part is similar to a Fermi C. However, for the occupied states, states are not occupied on the average one time, but on the average one minus mod lambda beat by mod lambda beat. Now, what's, what's the deal here? What's, what's, what's going on here? You know, to understand the interpretation of this fa fact, uh, let's recall the following. Suppose we took a free bosonic theory and we computed the following ensemble, trace e to the power minus b, epsilon minus q. In such a theory, any state with q greater than, uh, with q mu greater than epsilon um, 
if this this factor here instead of being a negative suppression is a positive enhancement so instead instead of being suppressed as you add more and more quanta to to the stress it's enhanced as you add more and more quanta to the stress and so this this stress then is dominated with occupation number of the state being infinity okay so in a free bosonic theory mu cannot exceed q times mu cannot exceed e there can be no you cannot take this, the chemical potential of your theory and make it larger than the charge uh, charge times chemical potential larger than the um, lowest energy state in your problem okay this is a famous result for free bosons and the reason you could not is that those states where which would have energy below the chemical potential would be infinitely populated here in this theory of the of bosons are not quite free there's these chern simons interactions and we see we can take the chemical potential to be larger than as large as we want and then instead of these states with energies below the chemical potential being infinitely populated they're populated by this number now notice that this number goes to infinity as lambda b goes to zero so in the limit lambda b goes to zero we we recover these naive the naive expectation however at lambda b non-zero this this infinity is tamed to a finite number. okay so this runaway boss condensate of a free theory with chemical potential larger than mass is tamed by the addition of these Chern-Simons interactions uh, in this interesting way. Okay, so the, on the bosonic side, the, 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 the finite chemical potential state that you get should be thought of as a regulated Bose condensate. Okay, now what is regulating this Bose condensate? Well, on the, first, let's remind, remind ourselves that on the fermion side, what regulates the Fermi state? It's just the Fermi exclusion principle, right? No state, no single particle state can be occupied more than once. That's why you can have chemical potentials larger than energy is no problem. If the state wants to be occupied, but cannot be occupied more than once. So it's not a, not a runaway thing. Now, you might think that, the, that what's happening here is that with the Chern-Simons interaction, we're getting a similar sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, result it might appear that no state can be occupied more than one minus lambda b times mod lambda b times which if you go back to fundamental quantities turns out to be mod kb divided by m no state can be occupied more than these times but you know mod kb by one by, by nb could be one over 137 or some, some some crazy fraction um what does it mean to say that you cannot occupy a state more than one over 137 times what does that mean this big fractional, this statement to me makes no sense. However, if you multiply this by NB, then what you get is the occupation numbers bounded by KB. And KB is an int integer, so this makes sense. Now, multiplying by NB is just summing over the occupation numbers of all states with the same space-time quantum numbers, but all, all colors. So, I think the right way to state this exclusion principle goes as follows. Um, the results are telling us that no bosonic state summed over all color quantum numbers can be occupied more than kb times okay so in these matter uh, john simon's theories we've discovered a new bosonic exclusion principle you you take these single particle states these effectively free single particle states there's a limit of how much the, how much they can be filled and the, the limit is that once you sum over uh, the filling of all states all qu color quantum numbers with the same space-time indices, they, they cannot be filled more than kb times. Now, where in this manner, the Bose exclusion principle is, of course, strongly reminiscent of the fact that one is not a, allowed to completely symmetrize more than k fundamental indices in SUN uh, k West Amino Witten theory. And uh, though, I, though we don't, don't uh, understand all details yet, it seems very likely to us that this this fact is the ultimate explanation for this bosonic ex exclusion principle and we're involved in trying to make this uh, precise okay uh, i had some more things to say about uh, um, about the phase diagrams of these theories um let me quickly say this and i'll skip the last part and then i'll stop i'm sorry for going on. um well through this talk i've talked about both condensed con both condensed phase but you could ask, what are the bosons that are condensing in this Bose condensed phase? This question is sort of meaningful because, uh, um, because you, you, we've seen that depending on the 
depending on the mass of our theory, uh, there are two kinds of bosonic excitations. There are, there are the phi excitations and there are the W bosons. So you might think that there are two kinds of Bose condensed phases for the bosons. Uh, <coughs> condensates of W bosons, condensates of phi excitations. Okay? And uh, um, when we do the calculation, you know, that's, that's how the calculation works. For one sign of mass, you work with a condensation, cond condensed phase for W bosons. For another sign of the mass, you work with a condensed phase for the phi excitation. But when you look at the answer in the end, it turns out the free energy and you know, everything that you, that you compute in these condensed phases, just this, on one side is an analytic continuation of the other side. So the answer here is just smooth. So the, uh, uh, so the answer is telling us that actually these Bose condensed phases of W bosons and Bose condensed phases of the phi fields are not distinct. They're just all the same phase. Yeah, there are no phase transitions between two different condensed phases. This is sort of nice because on the fermion side, it would have been a big surprise if there was phase condensed between, uh, transition between different Fermi C's uh, depending on signs of mass. Okay, and uh, then I, I've got more, more complicated phase diagrams for what I call regular fermion, sorry, regular boson and critical fermion theories, <coughs> but I'm not going to uh, bother you. So let me stop with the following this conclusions and discussion. Okay, the main output of this talk is this, this, this idea that in these large end theories where you can effectively think of these thermal ensembles as being free particle by free particle, free particle kind of ensembles, we've got this new occupation number formula. Well, Sohn and uh, friends had this new occupation number formula for the fermions. We have the bosonic counterparts of that. Okay, and I think these occupation number formulae are very interesting and would be nice to rederive from many different points of view. Okay, I mean, they, one parameter generalizations are very fundamental formulas of physics, and we should understand them. Better. Okay, I think it would be very interesting also to understand this Bose exclusion principle, principle more physically and from several points of view, and in particular to make clear the connection with Wessemino Witten representation theory. And uh, uh, then a couple of more physical points for discussion. Um, you know, Fermi C's have many interesting characteristic properties. For instance, there are these, uh, there are these uh, very low energy excitations, right? You take a particle and a hole with different momenta, but both near, very near the Fermi C. This two particle state has almost no energy, but it carries momentum. It carries momentum anywhere between zero and twice KF, where KF is the Fermi moment. Okay, uh, and the fact that these two particle states can carry momenta up to two KF leads to these two KF singularities and many correlation functions, let's say. JJ correlators and TT correlators. Okay. Now, the Bose condensate, on the other hand, that we've just described, um, all of th this property and other interest, many interest, other interesting properties of Fermi C's follow basically from two facts: a that there's a sharp Fermi surface, and b that there's an exclusion principle. Okay. The Bose condensate that we're talking about has both these properties: there's a sharp, sharp cutoff, and a basic uh, and an effective exclusion principle. So all the proper, all these Fermi C like properties will also work, I believe, with these Bose condensates. That's what allows them to make be dual to each other. Okay. Um, I think uh, this sounds somehow interesting to me. You, you know, it would be interesting to understand the implications of this Bose condensate, this Bose exclusion principle on dynamical phenomena. For instance, bosons have this property that they're gregarious. A boson likes preferably to go into a state in which there already were many bosons. And in these theories, that can't go on beyond a point because of the Bose exclusion. So how, how does that work? How do the Boltzmann transport equations of these theories work? Um, I think there are many interesting things to explore, but okay. Thank you. I'm sorry for going over time, but uh, way over time. That's the end of the day. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Shiraz, for the very nice talk.